Hello everyone, my name is Wesley Zane and I could not be more excited to welcome you to the official launch of my YouTube channel, Dubsy Books. The first thing you should probably know about me is that despite what the name of this channel might lead you to believe, I am not an avid reader by any sense of the word. I'm a reader, but I'm only a reader in the way that someone who learns a few chords on the guitar so that they can play a couple songs for their grandma is a guitar player. As a matter of fact, before uh, cracking open this bad boy, I had not read a book from start to finish, for fun at least, since I was 14 years old. I was a freshman in high school, and the book was... I actually don't remember the name of it, but it was the final book in Rick Riordan's uh, Heroes of Olympus series. So it was the he had the Percy Jackson books, and then he had those sequel books, right? And I kind of liked the sequel books quite a bit, but I thought the ending was so terrible. It was maybe even worse than what I realized at the time, because I think it eviscerated my love of reading for almost a decade now, like nine years. But hey, you know, what's nine years anyways? I think if anyone's around my age you might be able to relate to our devices and our content intake taking a kind of a, a pretty radical shift over these last few years. Last year, like over, over a year ago, May 2022, I, I did finish up with my undergraduate studies and I, and I finished up with college. After that, I really wanted to start implementing some, some major life changes. When I was little, I actually, I actually did used to read all, of, all the time. I think I was seven. I was in first grade whenever I read whatever the first Harry Potter book was. And, um, yeah, I, I don't want to give you guys a whole synopsis on all the books I was reading from, like, ages seven to 14 or anything, but it used to be a very regular part of my life, and now with access to TikTok and YouTube and Spotify, I can have something playing in my ears all day, and I don't have to... I guess, go through the, the work of reading, but something that I've discovered, and and I'll get into it a little bit later, is I, I, don't, I don't know how much work it really is. I think, you know, school kind of conditioned me to think of it in that way. I, I just had deadlines all the time. And again, when you have the internet available to you, even if you're supposed to be reading one of the most heralded books of all time, there's not really a way of knowing for sure which of those ones you're going to enjoy personally. So a lot of the time I'd be spark noting a lot of critical things or, or I'd be skim reading a lot of these like supposedly incredible pieces of literature um, that I just never really was able to absorb in a, in a super meaningful way. And so, you know, that leads me to a couple of the goals that I have for this channel. The first goal is I really want to give very candid, very straightforward takeaways about my own reading experiences. I can do my due diligence and my research on how to provide responsible literary criticism, but I don't want to talk to you guys in a, an overly academic way. <laughs> I want to largely help people who are maybe around my age. I want all people of any ages to be able to engage with my videos but I'm keeping the people who maybe are taking, you know, world literature, American literature in college, and they don't really know which ones that they should absolutely uh, read from cover to cover or which ones they should skim. And so I want to talk to you guys in such a way that you can get a better idea for, you know, someone who is kind of starting off in their own reading journey. And I would like to provide insights on that level in particular. And, and you guys will see what I mean as this channel continues to progress. If you guys know anything about this book in particular, you might already be wondering, well, I mean, Wesley, if you haven't been like a very big reader for a long time, why on God's earth, like what, what could possibly possess you to pick something that's famously very inaccessible and slow and confusing to be the first thing that gets you back into it. And I guess for me, I wanted to treat it like I'm jumping into like Barton Springs Pool, which is a very cold, natural spring 
pool here in the city that I live in currently, Austin, Texas. And if you're going to get into any sort of cold water, it's way more painful and agonizing if you just go in like like just slowly like you put your toe in and and then like slowly put it in your waist and then you know you get your fucking titties under it and you're like oh! like there's just you have like so many different checkpoints you know you got ankles hurt knees hurt dick and balls hurts waist hurts tits hurt head hurts but if you just cannonball onto it if you just Go into it all at once. Go into the deep end all at once. If you just go completely underwater, you get over the whole like shock of the cold like relatively quickly. And so I wanted to kind of shock myself back into mid-season form by taking on something that was, I think, let's see, 794 pages. So basically an 800-page book. This is by far the largest book that I've, I think I've ever read. Um... I don't know if any of the Harry Potter books are 794. I think a couple of them get close, but I, I, I think this is probably the biggest book I've ever read. And while there are very obvious hurdles, and I don't know if I can recommend this strategy to anyone who's in my position, for me, I don't feel that same sort of intimidation about really any sort of book, let alone just like shorter books. I, I, whenever I wasn't reading anything, the idea of reading anything was kind of intense <laughs> and kind of scary. Now I just don't have that same feeling whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I, I, I've I been a little bit lazy in putting this video together because I finished this thing kind of a while back. And, and I've actually completed other books since. So I don't know if I would... Well, I'll get into whether or not I recommend this thing to first-time or first-time long-time readers towards the end. But for me personally, I'm satisfied with that decision. Another thing that kind of motivated me into getting into this book was just I thought the ideas and the genre seemed like really, really cool. I've always been into sci-fi fantasy type of stories. Supposedly, this is kind of a book for people who don't read sci-fi. And I guess I haven't really read sci-fi. I mean, I, I watch science fiction films and there's different like sci-fi games and stuff that I've enjoyed. So that being said, I was still pretty intrigued by the idea of just kind of like a Game of Thrones in space or I, I really enjoy kind of political scheming. Some brief thoughts on the 2021 movie. Uh, I loved it when I first saw it because it was huge and big and epic and I saw it on IMAX and I saw it in theaters and that was cool. Since then, I don't know if I really think it's that great. I think there's reasons for that. I think it's really, really hard to make that type of movie very good anyways and based on the trailer for the second one and kind of knowing what goes down and the rest of the story, I'm super excited for the second film. I thought the actors in the first one did really amazing, which I thought would have been like probably the most difficult challenge because just some of the ways that this story is written and the ways that these different characters are written, I'll get into that a little bit later on. You'll see what I mean. Chalamet, I think, is really cool. I, the trailer for Willy Wonka just came out, and I thought he looks really bad in that. But everything I've so, so, just, but I think he looks bad because he's so cool. Um, and Willy Wonka's supposed to be kind of goofy and unpredictable and quirky and crazy. And I, I don't know if that's really like his vibe. But the character that he plays in the book, Paul Atreides, is very, <laughs> very cold. And I think he played that pretty well. And he brought enough humanity to it to make the film version accessible to people. But the person who I thought really, really was just kind of a shining star in that last one, and I'm excited even more to see what she does in the second one, is uh, Rebecca Ferguson as Lady Jessica. Some of the things that she was just doing with her face. I, I, if you haven't seen the movie, it's worth the watch for her alone. She's everything. With all of that out of the way... I'm going to go ahead and give a rundown of the entire plot of the story. And then after that, I'm going to just going to talk what happens, which means I'm going to spoil everything. Like spoiler warning. I'm spoiling everything. I don't know how to talk about things without just talking about what happened. I'm not here to tell you that Frank Herbert's 1965 Dune is a tour de force. But like, I'm just going to tell you what happened in the book and then we can reconvene and I'll get into how each stage of it was on my end. 
So, here we go. Several thousands of years in the future, humanity now occupies territory across different planets run by royal families, or houses, all of whom are subservient to the Emperor. In this particular future, however, technology is no longer utilized after an ancient war was fought between humans and the machines, and won by the humans. Now, in order to achieve interstellar travel, they must rely upon a substance known as the Spice Melange, which can only be mined on the desert planet Arrakis. Arrakis is a nightmarish hellscape with no moisture to speak of, and massive sandworms consistently terrorize the terrain. The people native to the planet, known as the Fremen, have been able to persist for millennia with the undying plan to ever so slowly create a fertile, Eden-like environment filled with vast swaths of water, largely due to the religious belief that one day a savior will arrive known as the Lisan al-Gaib to lead the ecological revolution. In reality, the Lisan al-Gaib is nothing more than a myth that was planted amongst the Fremen generations prior by missionaries belonging to an all-female society of witches known as the Bene Gesserit. Now these ladies are a bit strange. They manipulate the political landscape from the shadows and practice eugenics in an attempt to one day birth a male version of themselves with unrivaled power. The Kwisatz Haderach. The Lisan al-Gaib myth, as well as many others like it, were spread to primitive cultures across the Imperium in order to foster subservience for the Kwisatz Haderach's arrival, whenever it shall come. The story kicks off right after the Emperor informs Duke Lado of House Atreides that it will be his house that is responsible for taking over mining responsibilities on Arrakis from House Harkonnen. This order is duplicitous in nature. Under these circumstances, we are introduced to our protagonist, Paul Atreides, the boy child to his father Lado, the Duke of House Atreides, and his mother Jessica, an esteemed but notably unmarried Bene Gesserit lady. Jessica takes him to undergo testing from the creepy Reverend Mother, Gaius Mohayim. Once he successfully survives the test, we are left to wonder if Paul really is the Kwisatz Haderach of legend after all. Shortly after landing on Arrakis, the Atreides are ambushed by the Harkonnens with the help of a spy within the Atreides ranks, the treasonous Dr. Yue, as well as the Emperor's personal military force, the brutal Sardukar, disguised as Harkonnen soldiers. The Duke is killed and fails to take down the Harkonnen leader, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, in the process, despite a desperate final attempt. The Atreides are almost entirely wiped out, but Paul and Jessica are able to survive and escape with the help of the traitor Dr. Yue, who has his own vendetta against the Baron and wishes no harm to Paul. Paul and Jessica survive the desert long enough to successfully join forces with the Fremen. After successfully assimilating into their ranks, Paul and Jessica discover that these indigenous people are in fact extremely lethal fighters themselves, perhaps even deadlier than the feared Sardaukar. In addition to possessing extraordinary capabilities in hand-to-hand -hand combat bred through generations of oppressive conditions, they are also able to navigate the harsh terrain by riding on the backs of the f***ing sandworms. Paul and Jessica, with their Bene Gesserit knowledge of the Lisan al-Gaib myth, successfully manipulate the Fremen into making them question if Paul himself really is their long-awaited savior after all. With the newfound direct access to Spice, Paul's powers only grow more fearsome, consistently lending more credence to the Messiah murmurs amongst the Fremen. In the midst of the situation, Paul further assimilates by finding a life partner and woman to mother his child, in Chani, daughter of Liet Kynes, planetary ecologist of Dune and Fremen leader. The Fremen hold a ceremony to fully welcome Jessica to the clan as their new reverend mother, replacing the old Bene Gesserit who is old and dying. As a part of the ceremony, Jessica drinks a mysterious liquid that is only made safe to drink by her witch-like chemical manipulation. Once Jessica has achieved a heightened state from the liquid, she is embraced by the dying reverend mother who transfers her entire spirit into Jessica's mind. This ritual has been practiced for millennia, meaning that Jessica absorbs the collective life memories of countless generations of Bene Gesserit and even those who came before. She is unable to shield this from affecting her unborn daughter. The child, Aaliyah, also absorbs the collective memories while still in her mother's womb. 
Only with the aid of her mother's calming presence is Aaliyah able to keep from succumbing to fear and losing her mind. Aaliyah is born with complete understanding of the evils of mankind. She never experiences an innocent moment. Immediately upon her birth, she is feared and viewed as evil by many Fremen due to her unnatural behavior. Two years pass after Jessica's ceremony, and now Paul is faced with a significant ritual of his own. In his time spent among the Fremen, Paul's capabilities have grown dramatically due to increased exposure to the spice. He is fully rounded into the messianic figure he was always destined to become. Today marks the final test for the savior, Paul Muad'Dib, riding his first sandworm. Once approached by a worm larger than he has ever witnessed before, Paul is able to harness the power of the desert and ride the beast successfully. Paul has ascended to God status. Once their forces have gathered into prime position to attack the Harkonnens, Paul decides to drink from the water of life, leaving him in such a deep coma that he is worried to be dead. When he eventually comes to after an extended rest, he has achieved near omniscience. Now, instead of having brief glimpses into potential futures, he sees all of time, past, present, and future, all at once. When the attack begins, Paul and the Fremen ride their sandworms into battle and make quick work of the Harkonnens. The Emperor tries to throw a fit and manipulate the situation to his advantage. He attempts to have the Baron's nephew, Fade Raltha, duel Paul to the death. In the end, Paul takes the Emperor's daughter as his wife and anoints himself the new Emperor. There is no righteous conquest. However, since Paul now understands with his newfound omniscience that there is no averting the bloodshed and the holy wars to come, the full realization of the terrible purpose that he has spent the entire novel hoping to avoid has settled in and been accepted as fate. All right. So given that this book is a bit of a mountain, if there weren't at least some bits that were extraordinarily good, there is zero chance that I was going to finish this thing. So Dune is split up into three different sections of books and books two and three are great a bit of foreshadowing there for the next part of this video I, I know i started to get pretty sucked in after the harkonnen invasion uh, once the duke dies and jessica and paul have to escape into the desert uh, to go find the fremen i finally started to, to perk up a little bit in my seat from there it really just never stopped escalating one aspect that i actually did love even from the very beginning it's just the perspective that the author decided to use. Essentially, 90% of the novel is just spent hopping around inside the minds of all of the characters of the story. And I can see why some might gravitate to uh, other books that reveal themselves more through consistent action. And as I progress in this channel, maybe I'll find that I prefer that as well. But as someone with a very, very distinct and hyperactive uh, inner monologue, for instance, Unless I actively try to pull myself out from behind my eyes by doing something like reading a book, <laughs> most of my life experience is basically just all of the words that are hopping around my head in sequence at any given moment. And so with the way this was written, I felt like I was able to get a pretty intimate feel for all the primary chess pieces particularly Jessica in the earlier sections and Paul in the later ones. Even though he's pretty inhuman and it's hard to relate to, I guess, by that point, I, I just couldn't get enough of that guy. Like I found him so, so, so compelling. In a way, I could see a critic viewing the next thing that I'm going to say as a bit of an indictment as far as being too simple or something. But I guess I remember struggling in English classes whenever I was a kid to pick up on the different allegories or metaphors that were present in the subject matter at hand. But here, there's a ton. And I don't know, I felt really, really smart that I was able to pick up on them in the moment. This is a story about ecology, but it's also a story about religion and power games and groupthink and fear. There's a lot happening in this. It also makes really strong use of the sci-fi genre, as far as I can tell. There are two instances of this that I want to point out. The birth of Alia and the ending. So, as compelling as this story is, I didn't really find it to be especially emotional. And I got through a giant chunk of this thing 
without ever really considering the possibility of crying. But then, out of nowhere, Alia happens. It took me a while to try and pinpoint exactly why this section disturbed me so much. The idea of robbing someone of the ability to experience anything for the first time in life in a way that is really unique to their own self is such a horrific idea. She is her own person in the world, and yet nothing about who she is is hers. She doesn't 100% own any of her own person, any of her own self. And to have to watch a mother subject her unborn daughter to such a fate, chills. Goosies. And as for the ending, this might be the best ending to any book or movie that I can think of. It's like Michaela Maroney's vault landing at the 2012 Olympics. Like it's it's just flawless. Like just the whole third book is soaring through the sky and like, it's perfect. I really think that you can use what you think about Paul to discover a lot about yourself and how you view the world. Basically, if you think that free will is a thing in the Dune story, you think Paul is evil. And if you think there's no free will, you might still see him as evil. It's possible, but... He suddenly becomes way more sympathetic, and I'm definitely more in the latter. I couldn't personally see any reason to doubt that he was not going to be able to avoid his terrible purpose that he kept mentioning. That boy was going to lead millions to die in a jihad, whether he wanted to or not. And at the bare minimum, I know that it caused him pain. I know that he didn't want to. It's just that where there's room for analysis is in every step of the story, his actions lead him right into that fate. And he does keep choosing to do that. I'm just going off of my own interpretation here. I'm just thinking these th things through. And maybe I'm biased because I don't really necessarily believe in free will in real life. And I didn't get the sense that it exists in the book either. The way I see it, Herbert repeatedly points out just how important it is to fill this critical void that we all have as humans with something to put our faith into. The Fremen lead dreadfully miserable lives, and yet they persist on Arrakis because they're able to gain fulfillment by living for something greater than themselves. But what's really, really important to note, and I, I gotta mention it here, and it's gonna be a bummer, we gotta talk about it, there is nothing greater than themselves, at least in the story. Their religion is a lie. And their prophet is false. And yet, I think it's crystal clear that the author is trying to tell us the person who suffers the worst fate in Dune is Paul. Once he finally ascends and fully realizes his Kwisatz Satarak form, there is nothing left for him to discover. There is nothing left for him to put his faith into. He sees all. Past, present, future. He is imprisoned by the inability to ever discover and therefore is totally stripped of the remaining bits of his humanity. Also, it's really clear that he's tormented by his ability to see all of the flaws in his peers and anyone who's around him. And yet, he is hopeless to do anything to help. Stilgar, for instance, is a total shell of himself by the end of the story. But we would all, 100 times out of 100, rather be him at the end of the book because even though Stilgar might be a shell, Paul is in hell. Bars. Deciding what we put our faith into is a really challenging tightrope. Even though feeling that chasm in each of us is maybe the most important thing we can ever do, the existence of that hole at all is probably what represents the greatest threat to our well-beings. Not only will most known ways of filling it lead us off of a cliff, refusing to fill it at all will rot us from the inside. And that, my friends, makes for a pretty metal ending. Okay, so right out the gate, the first thing that sucks about this book is the cover. I mean... I mean, look at this. What, what is that? I mean, that it, this is truly a two-pack of ass. This is terrible. I had a horrific realization visiting a bookstore uh, with a friend of mine. 
And I saw a, a newer copy of Dune, and the cover looked so cool. And I wanted to buy it so bad just to have, even though there is no chance that I read this thing again for at least several years. Is that is that like, is that a common problem? People people who read books is, is this a problem? Is this going to be an issue for me for the rest of my life? Am I going to be constantly like having to fight off the demons, telling me to buy new copies of books just because the cover's cool, even if I'm not going to read them or I've already read them? Because that is a that's a shocking realization that I I, I was not prepared for. It's just it's just it, it, it's the cover. It's so it's just it's so uninteresting. It's just a rectangle. I mean. It looks like there's a couple of little figures there, maybe in the shadow of what might be a, a sandworm. They could have done so much better. And if you look at some of the other copies, they, they have done so much better. And I'm just a little bitter that the copy that I decided to steal from my brother, who was already borrowing it from a friend of his, is this cover. I mean, what did I do to deserve that? It's just lackluster. I, I, des- I deserve better. In terms of the actual issues with the story... It's boring. I mean, it's just really boring. I just want to insert that Scott Pilgrim clip of Scott Pilgrim going, wow, it's boring. Just the way he says it. It it perfectly encapsulates exactly how I feel about the majority of book one of this book. Um, It just moves really, really slowly. And I don't even think that the slow pace, the slow pace is an issue. I got I got to say this thing doesn't get good literally until at least 400 pages in which is crazy because there's no way that I can in good faith recommend this book to people who don't read books there's I'd be sabotaging them like I can't do it in good conscience it's just not an option so I'm not going to do that you you can realistically fit the size of three decent books into the first 400 pages of shit that is the first half of this book. It is worth it in the end. It's not fun to get through, and it took me forever to finally get over that hurdle. And I think what makes it so grueling and so agonizing of an experience to get through is that he just starts throwing out lingo that he made the fuck up, which is admirable. I mean... People always like praise Tolkien for creating languages and worlds, and this guy puts in, obviously, an absurd amount of effort into world building, and just all the lore is way deeper than even I have a realistic understanding of at the moment. You can just tell. But he just starts throwing out these terms without any sort of introduction to them at all, and I, I thought it was silly. I thought the idea of turning to the multiple appendices and so appendix one appendix two and then okay so there's an there are two separate appendices and a terminology of the imperium section that you can consult during the back of the book if you're ever confused within the first you know 100 pages or so and i actually recommend that you do that not because i did that i didn't do that i thought it was stupid and goofy i thought that idea seemed kind of ridiculous and i don't think that you should have to but realistically if you want to get a decent like idea of what's going on you ought to because i don't think i really understood what the chome company was ever (laughs) i don't think i i they controlled money kind of I, i didn't really get a great sense of it until i think towards like the very very end the guild i got a little bit oh Here's the, here's the real thing that I'm embarrassed to admit. I think I was seven-eighths of the way through. I thought Princess Irulan was Paul's daughter that was, like, talking to us from the future. Because all of the little chapters start from sayings of books that have yet to be written in the story, which is a really cool thing, I might add. And the vast majority of them, I, if not all of them, I think are uh, attributed to Princess Irulan. And I just figured that, well, Paul is going to ascend to the throne and this princess that we haven't really met yet or whatever is just going to be his daughter. But she ends up being like the most cucked woman ever (laughs) in the story. And she's very much not his daughter. Um, Yeah, I saw I saw that Florence Pugh was cast as Princess Irulan. I'm thinking. 
is there like a crazy time jump? There's a bit of a time jump, but is there like a multi-decade time jump that I haven't seen yet? No, it's not his daughter at all. So I think contextually you'll be a lot less confused and maybe and maybe the beginning section will be a little bit smoother and you can kind of get through the the slow pace of it all a little easier than I was. And that's pretty much it for all the things that I really can't stand about the book and I would honestly say that the cover here in this instance is just as his it, the cover is genuinely just as big of an issue as the other two for me. Um, but yeah, this is a much shorter section for a reason. It, it, it's a great book. I still recommend that you check it out. There is one additional detractor that I wanted to devote a little bit of extra time to in the end section. I didn't want to just throw it into the bad category because I think there is an interesting conversation to be had. And so I'm going to try to do that with, I guess, myself in this last little bit here. Um, but yeah, hang on with me. As the title of this video might suggest, despite having been clearly a very progressive thinker of his time, Frank Herbert most likely had a very glaring blind spot. I'm going to go ahead and get into that a little bit now. So... I am far from the first person to point this out, but as far as I can tell, there is only one gay character in this story, the Baron. The Baron, for all intents and purposes, is easily the most repulsive character that we come across. While it wouldn't be a great look on the progressive front for Mr. Herbert to have the token gay be the big bad, it gets significantly worse in my opinion, by the decision to make the Baron an incestuous pedophile. On page 28, he has this thought come across his mind upon seeing his own nephew. He glanced at Fade Routha, noting his nephew's lips, the fool and pouting look of them. On page 388, we as readers have the unfortunate opportunity to witness a Harcoidian slip of sorts, while once again thinking about his nephew Fade, the Baron thinks this. He'll learn. And such a lovely body. Really a lovely boy. And even when he's able to distract himself from the whole incest bit, he regularly practices the rape of his own slave boys, as he alludes to on page 303. I'll be in my sleeping chambers, the Baron said. Bring me that young fellow we bought on Gamont. The one with the lovely eyes. Drug him well. I don't feel like wrestling. So this is immediately pretty upsetting in a modern context, given the harmful stereotype of queer men in particular representing a clear and present danger to young children. But it's not 100% out of the realm of possibility that the Baron's characterization is entirely coincidental. I always want to be careful about making snap judgments, particularly about those who lived in a different time and are no longer here to defend themselves. Fortunately, uh, the internet is a really remarkable place, and there are opportunities abound to find more context for Mr. Herbert's thought process. Right here on YouTube, you can find a guest lecture that he did at UCLA in April of 1985, just about 10 months before he died. At one point, a student takes the opportunity to ask Frank about why he decided to portray his token gay character in a way that, and I'm quoting the kid now, can only promote bigotry and violence against lesbians and gay men. His response is pretty interesting. I was saying that homosexuality is a natural occurrence in our society, and to be in your teens, you're naturally this way. He goes on to say that primitive societies have dealt with it in a different way than our society deals with it. And lots of times, we create the abhorrent gay, and there are abhorrent gays just as there are abhorrent other individuals by our social reactions to them. And I just gave you an abhorrent gay in the Dune books. Side note, Herbert actually pronounces the word abhorrent as aberrant, uh, which is really cute to me. So go watch that if you are interested in hearing that word pronounced that way. But what I was also saying to you was sadomasochism is sometimes a part of this. I can give you chapter and verse on that. And that gays have a much harder problem coming out of the social pressures than the rest of us do in many instances. 
Now, on the one hand, for someone to even be willing to admit that homosexuality is a natural occurrence was probably a pretty progressive thing in and of itself to say amongst any crowd in the United States in the mid-80s. But I found the comment about sadomasochism to stick out in particular. I did a little bit of half-assed digging on the internet and tried to find studies linking homosexuality with any sort of predisposition to sadomasochistic tendencies to see if I could try and clear up what his point might have been. And, well... I wasn't able to find anything on that front exactly. There are a number of papers that delve into the different behaviors of gay men as opposed to straight men who decide to engage in S&M in general, and I think I may have found the most good faith interpretation possible of what Herbert may have been attempting here. I'll have these linked in the description, and I encourage you all to take a look for yourselves, but essentially, the largest statistically significant distinction in sadomasochistic behaviors is this. Gay men who engage in S&M appear more likely, on average, to gravitate towards sadism or hypermasculine behaviors, while straight men appear more likely to lean into masochistic or humiliation-based practices. There's also a reference to prior research that had been apparently found that gay men might have an anti-effeminacy bias. The implication here being that for both gay and straight men, their respective S&M behaviors are likely indicative of a desire to escape from the pressures of their societal expectations. So, given that bit of background, Herbert's comments on the roles that sadomasochism and social pressures play make a bit more sense, I guess? The thing is, though, that these studies also made it very clear that these are occurrences in consensual interactions, and that basically, regardless of whether someone is gay or not, most of these people have well-adjusted positions in day-to-day -day life while keeping their sexual preferences entirely siloed off from any potential unwanting parties. It also seems like the vast majority of people don't delve into the world of sadomasochism until after they've already experienced plenty of vanilla sex anyway. So at best, Frank's treatment of the Baron is an exceptionally short-sighted attempt at providing any sort of insightful commentary on how social pressures can impact the manifestations of our sexuality. I'm not necessarily saying that Frank should have included a passage about how the mighty and stoic Duke Leto secretly loved to be pegged by the Lady Jessica, but it would serve just as much of a purpose in moving the story forward as the pedophile shit, while actually demonstrating a superior understanding of the theme that he was trying to explore. Lastly, I think the biggest giveaway that I came across personally, that Herbert was probably just a pretty homophobic guy, comes just moments later in that UCLA lecture, where after he has already said his piece and everyone is ready to move on, he decides, entirely unprompted, to point out how gays have decided against continuing the species, so make of that what you will. My goal in covering this in this video is not to piss on Herbert's legacy or anything, but instead, I think it presents a really solid opportunity to show that people are complex and you shouldn't be able to tell everything, or really much of anything at all, based on one single opinion they might have. For instance, who knows? That homophobic neighbor of yours might also be really passionate about ecology and the need to protect our planet. Maybe you should go explore that. So typically when reviewing books or films, most critics are a lot of the time encouraged to give some sort of number score, usually on a 5 to 10 point scale. But I don't really believe in that, especially considering my opinion is so often influenced by a ton of just auxiliary factors and it can really change day by day. So I, I would never feel super confident to give anything like a rock solid number score and put that onto the internet for it to, it's just now occurring to me that I, I, I do have a letterbox and I, and I, and I do, the, do that, I guess, technically, but don't read into that too much if you ever add me on there. Anyways, we're not doing that here. No number scores on this channel. Instead, we have badges, okay? So yeah, I'm gonna use this video to introduce you guys to my badge system. These are gonna be little descriptive badges that I assign to the different books that I'm reading. They will serve the purpose of quickly summarizing some of their more significant components. To anyone out there who plays NBA 2K, this should make perfect sense. It's basically that. You know what I'm talking about. Anyone who doesn't play 2K, you'll probably catch on very, very quickly. By the time I'm 10 videos deep or so, you guys should be more or less familiar with all of the different badges in my catalog. So, 
for Frank Herbert's Dune, I am assigning the Spark Notes Repellent Badge. Just because I, I do deem this book to be worth your time if it is assigned reading in class or anything, and you're wondering if it's worth the investment. I am also assigning it the Just Trust Me Badge, because it does have a slow start, and this one is really stretching it. Uh, and yet somehow it is all worth it in the end. As a matter of fact, from this point forward, I am renaming the Just Trust Me badge to the Dune Just Trust Me badge. And with that, my video comes to a close. If you have made it this far, thank you so much. I have really big plans for this channel. I'm really, really excited to tackle a ton of different books that you guys might be recommending. I'm going to link some of my socials just in the description. I'm going to try not to be super annoying at the end of every video and, and tell you to comment and subscribe and everything, but hopefully that goes without saying. Obviously, it helps me out a ton. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to produce more videos for you guys, and hopefully I get better in the process and make things more engaging. They shouldn't all be this long, by the way. I, I, I hope the majority of them are going to be just kind of my general thoughts and then some badges and you know maybe I'll maybe I'll go for like a more extended type of video again for for specific for specific things that I, I really want to do that I want to do bigger deep dives into but uh just this is kind of a uh this is kind of a, a grand opening of sorts so I, I wanted to go a little bit above and beyond for this one but the vast majority of them I want to try to shoot for like eight twelve minutes just give like some general breakdowns, throw a badge or two, and then move on to the next. Thanks once again. Uh, I've been Wesley, and uh, hopefully you see a lot more of me here on Dubsy Books. Love you all. Bye.